Hello, hello. I'm Andrew Brokus. Most of you watching this probably know this, but I am the author of this Thinking Poker blog that you're seeing on your screen right now, and I am one of the co-hosts of the Thinking Poker podcast. This free poker strategy video is available to you as a result of a fundraising campaign that I conducted for a nonprofit organization called the Bay Area Urban Debate League that I'm uh, involved with. If you enjoy this video, you certainly are uh, encouraged to go to uh, baudl.com org and uh, make a contribution it would definitely be appreciated um, but uh, this this video is also available as a result of the generosity of mark uh, mark was one of the donors to this campaign and uh, he was one of the grand prize winners i chose a couple of donors um, at random and gave them the opportunity uh, well, the, the, the top prize was uh, a custom coaching video like the one that you're about to see where I reviewed a hand history that Mark played and gave him some feedback and some, just, some suggestions on uh, things that I think he would benefit from working on. So if you find this interesting and uh, think that you would be interested in something like that yourself, I would be happy to do it for you. Uh, you can find me here at thinkingpoker.net. If you want more details about the coaching specifically, you can uh, click here on coaching and see a couple different uh, live, uh, not live coaching, but your know, one-on-one -on -one over Skype coaching uh, that I offer. And specifically these uh, customized video reviews is what you're about to see. There's a sample here on the website as well. If you're interested in, you know, even if you're just interested in another free poker strategy video, there's one here that you can watch. And uh, like this one, it will provide a sample of the kind of custom video that I can provide. And you can find uh, up-to-date pricing information on there as well. That's just if you're interested. Um, but for now, enjoy the following video. And thanks again to Mark for allowing me to make this public. Alrighty, well, uh, thanks again for your donation and congratulations on winning one of the grand prizes. As you suggested, I will start with a couple of these uh, individual hands that you uh, requested that I look at, and then we'll focus primarily on the final uh, two tables, or final three tables, and uh, time permitting, I'll kind of circle back to the beginning and see if there's anything else worth discussing. Uh, so opening queen jack suited under the gun, I like. I think stacks are, uh, I mean, it's a Pretty solid hand, even for early position, regardless. But I think you know, at these stacks, it is important to be able to make different types of hands post flop. So it's not just you know, um, this this flop. In fact, is an interesting example. I mean, queen jack suited is not the the very strongest hand that you could have on this board. But if the only hands you're opening under the gun are like pocket pairs and big aces. Um, you're going to miss this board quite often, and you're very rarely going to have a hand that you want to play for 8,000 chips. Like, even if you have pocket aces here, are you really going to look to put in 20 times the size of the pot? Probably not. So the fact that if, for instance, the turn is a 9, you could potentially have the nuts, that's pretty valuable for you. Um, whether or not to see bet here is tricky. Uh, I think that the... Nikki, just, I mean, I, I don't know if these are your stats or if these are hands that I already had on this player, but um, if you have some reason to think that this player is a little too loose pre-flop, which for a $10 rebuy tournament, there's a decent chance that that's true. You know, the looser your opponent is pre-flop, the more profitable it's going to be to just bet um, any two cards on the flop. Your hand isn't, isn't quite any two cards, um, but it's not a fantastic... I mean, this is... What I'm thinking is this is just a board that I think favors a good player's pre-flop calling range pretty well. Um, I wouldn't expect a lot of folds on this flop, but I think with two over cards and a gut shot, I mean, your hand isn't really strong enough to check call. So I think C betting is, is probably good. Um, I'm tempted to err on the larger side because there's a lot of hands that I wouldn't C bet here. Like I think hands like ace king, ace queen, ace jack, especially if you don't have um, you know either a spade or two hearts, uh, I would want to probably just check fold a lot of those. Um, so I think that when you do bet here, you're going to be kind of polarized, and I think you should choose a somewhat larger bet sizing for that reason. It's also it's a, a flop texture that favors the player in position um, because the the turn and river are so likely to be you know really significant cards, and it's going to be like you can imagine it's going to be tough for you to play a lot of your range when the turn is a spade, for instance. So that that kind of thing favors the players in position, and that again is a reason to um, give that player less good odds for calling a continuation bet, whatever hand it is that you're that you're betting with. It's not specific to your having queen jack. Um, so I, I would, I think betting is fine. I would probably want to bet more like 240 to 280 on this board texture, but not a big deal. Uh, he calls the seven is, I mean, one of the many cards that really favors the player in position. You know, it's a tough card for you to continue. I certainly don't want to continue bluffing with the hand that you have now. It was already kind of borderline to use this as a bluff, even on the flop. Um, 
I don't think you should really do a lot of betting on this turn card in general. I can imagine you having hands like 10-9 suited or 9-8 suited here that I would also want to check and call with. Um, or I mean, this is going to be a check fold, this hand here, but... Like, even if you have pocket aces, I don't know that betting is best. I think against weaker players, it probably is best to just bet fold pocket aces. Um, but yeah, certainly not betting queen jack. When it goes check jack, I think this is an important thing to pay attention to, to what this player is telling you when she checks behind the turn. Because I find this very significant that she's choosing not to bet. Um, this is not a board where I expect to see a lot of slow playing. I think even if this player had just made the nuts, they're not very likely to slow play it. I definitely don't think this player is going to be checking here with two pair or a set, even if she chose not to raise them on the flop. So she's telling you that her range is pretty capped when she checks behind. And, and I would pretty seriously consider bluffing the river on the basis of her checking behind. Now, in this case, the river is the nine and you don't really need to bluff. But um, yeah, I, I would pretty seriously consider bluffing if the river had been... Uh, a different spade, for instance. Well, actually, spades are probably a decent part of her range, but if the, river, if the river had been, let's say, the deuce of diamonds, I think that's a pretty good spot for you to make a big bet, because I think that her failure to, to check the turn is capping her range pretty well, and I can see you checking hands like 10-9 or even pocket aces on the turn. Um, so now we're in an interesting spot. You river to straight, a flush is possible. I do think flushes are in Nikki's range. I would say that you have two choices here. Um, I would be choosing between either betting or check folding. And I see that you did check here. And my question is, or my concern is that you were planning on checking and calling. And I think that's a kind of a common reaction in these sorts of situations where you're saying to yourself, well, I like my hand, but it could easily be beat. Um, so I don't really want to bet to go into the pot, but I don't want to fold either. So I guess check calling is just sort of a nice compromise. And that's really not what it is. Check calling is something that you should do explicitly for the purpose of inducing a bluff. Other than that, and, and I mean, that's not terrible, I guess. And, and I mean, if you really think this player is going to take and turn a pair into a bluff, uh, you know, I guess that's okay. But I think a lot of times if this player um, has one pair, they're going to have two pair, right? Like, it's kind of hard for them to have just one pair because so many 10-9, uh, 9-8, 8-7, 8-10, all these hands have, you know, the, the kinds of hands that are going to have an 8 in them have, have mostly made two pair here. So I don't think we're going to see Nikki turning a lot of hands into bluffs. And that's why I say I think if you check, you should, should assume that she mostly just has flushes when she bets and you can fold. Um, if you want to try to get value from your hand, then I think you have to bet it yourself. You can't really expect that Nikki is going to bet worse hands for you. So I think the reasoning behind checking is that like if you're afraid that she has a flush and you're saying, well, um, you know, but I guess what I, what I want to point out is that you're not saving a bet if she has a flush. If you check and call, you're putting a bet into the pot just like if you bet yourself and, and she calls, you're putting a bet into the pot. So you're really not going to save a bet against a flush by checking and calling. What you're gonna, what's going to happen is you're going to lose a bet if she had a hand, that, like even a jack, Nikki might not bet with. Um, but certainly if she has a hand like 10-9, I don't think you're going to bet, but she might call with it. So what you're doing by checking and calling is you're still paying off the flushes, but you're costing yourself a bet against uh, some, some hands that might check behind, but would be willing to call your bet and are behind you. So I think in these situations, you should usually just value bet rather than trying to split the difference by checking and calling, unless you have some good reason to think your opponent is going to bluff, which is not the case here. Um, I also, I think maybe the other concern is that you're thinking if I bet and she raises, what am I going to do? I think you can fold very comfortably. I don't think you have to worry about getting bluff raised in that spot. So I, I wouldn't sweat that either. And I, I think that you probably should bet the river. If you're not going to bet the river, it should be a check fold. I think that's really the more important thing to recognize. And if that was your plan, I'm, I'm more okay with it. If your plan was to check call, I think that's, um, that's a larger mistake. Okay, so that was hand 41. This is 42. 43, 44, 45, 46. This ace king suited was the next one that you asked about. Once again, tangling with Nikki, min raising under the gun. Um, I think you know, you've know you got a little bit of um, leeway here in terms of whether you want a three better call with ace king suited. Um, I think you know, Nikki seems a little bit splashy, uh, just looking at these 30, 13 stats, which again, you might not have even had access to. Uh, I think with your stack depth, I like three betting a little bit more. Um, you know, if, if you're shallower to the point where a three bet is like committing you to to, um, to put in all your chips if she shoves, I'd be a little less excited about three betting. But I think here, you know, ace king suit is a good deal better than ace king offsuit at the stack depth, like over 100 blinds deep. Um, so I, I would probably default to three betting. I don't think calling would be terrible by any means. Um, I might go a little smaller than this actually because you have position. Um, I don't think you have to worry about pricing her out too much, but then again, your opponents are probably a little bit too loose, so I don't hate that at all. Interesting spot now. Um, 
Well, let's, let me see what you do first, and then I'll comment. Yeah, I don't love continuation betting here. I suspect that you're kind of just thinking of your, of your hand as, as a bluff, or you're saying to yourself, I really just want my opponent to fold. And I understand that you want your opponent to fold, but the reason that you want her to fold is that you're hoping she doesn't have a pair. Um, and if she doesn't have a pair, you're, you're pretty well ahead. In fact, there's a very good chance that you're way ahead. Like a lot of her calling range that is not a pair is going to be hands like ace-queen, ace-jack, king-queen that you're dominating. So there's really not a lot of danger in giving those a free card. And, and especially on this board texture, I think there's a lot of turn cards where you can actually check behind with ace-king and call a bet. So I, where I'm going with this is that I think your hand is really too good for turning into a bluff. And it's, a, it's an okay bluffing hand because the ace and the king are both probably outs against our calling range, but I would rather do this if I had like ace king of spades, even ace king of diamonds, where there's going to be potential to run a bigger bluff. So I don't think just like bluffing once is a great plan with ace king. I think it, it can be an okay hand for multi-barreling, but I think if I'm going to do that, I would I want to have a little bit more equity than just two overcards. And mostly I just think ace king is a strong enough hand that you don't really need to turn it into a bluff right now. Like I think you'll win often enough by checking that there's not that much value value in, in betting here as a bluff. So, okay, she check calls, and now you can't feel as good about your hand anymore. Um, and, I th and I think, like, checking behind here is, is, is what you don't want to do. Like, I, I think if you're, as I was saying before, if, if you're going to run a bluff with ace-king, it should be a, good, a big one designed to get her off of a pair to put pressure on a hand like pocket eights or pocket nines. Just betting once is giving her exactly what she wants when she has a hand like pocket eights or pocket nines. And you're just allowing her to play perfectly when you take a line like this. She's going to fold the hands that you dominate on the flop. She's going to call the hands that you're behind. And you're never really going to put any pressure on those hands that you're behind. Um, if you did actually have aces, kings, queens, etc., like, this is a really nice run out for you to keep betting. There's almost nothing that beats you. So you know, I don't think you can very credibly bluff later after you check behind the turn because um, a lot of your strongest hands you would have just fired again on the turn. Uh, so the river comes a queen. I mean, I guess you can try to represent that you had ace queen here. I don't even know that I would advise you to three bet that against uh, an under the gun open anyway. Um, I mean, it's it's okay. I think there's there's maybe even some chance that you had the best hand here anyway. Uh, I suppose it's better than checking behind. I just I really wish you would either not bet the flop or had kept betting on the turn. I think that this bet check bet bluffing line is not the ideal one. Um, I suppose it's better than bet check check, but. Uh, yeah, I'm, mostly I, I want you to see why maybe betting the flop isn't the best idea. I think you shouldn't just automatically continuation bet um, just because you, you put in a three bet preflop. I think you want to think about what hands is my opponent actually um, going to fold. Um, I might actually pause this a second while I find the next hand. <clears throat> So I think opening ace five suited from the cutoff is very straightforward. Can't imagine ever doing anything different. Um, we get three bet by this player who uh, I am showing quite tight stats on him, but uh, I know that you referred to the player as a mid stakes rig. Um, so I think that I, I'd say, I mean, basically, I just think it makes sense that if you're going to have a value for betting range, which I imagine you are here, like if you had pocket aces or pocket kings, you'd probably want to four bet those. You should have a little bit of a light four betting range as well. And um, I, I, maybe ace king is good enough to four bet get in here. Maybe it isn't. Um, but I mean, uh, that almost goes into the value four bet range itself. So I think it makes sense to have some kind of light four bet. The important thing I would say is not to get carried away with, with doing this, but ace five suited is a very good hand to choose. Um, even if. Uh, uh, never mind that. But yeah, ace five suited is a, is a very good hand to choose. Um, it, it's a hand that has a surprising amount of equity, even against extremely strong ranges. Having the ace blocker is quite good. Um, so I think as a kind of 
Uh, ace five suited is like the best hand to choose. The, the important thing is that you're not doing this with like any suited ace. I think that you end up doing this with far too high of a frequency because I don't think your value for betting range is very wide here. It's probably just you aces, kings, maybe queens, maybe ace king. Um, I, I don't. I, I kind of doubt that you're doing a whole lot more for betting than that. So you don't get to have much of a bluffing range here, but you should have a little bit of a bluffing range. And ace five suited is probably the single best one to choose. So I think it's it's a fine spot for it. It's a good hand for it. Um, I doubt the expected value of this play is significantly greater than zero, but I think it's a good thing to do. And it could end up being much greater than zero if, for instance, his three betting percentage is, is way out of whack. But the point is, you don't have to know that. Like you don't have to know that he is or isn't three betting way too much. It's you know you're supposed to have some kind. Of bluffing range and that's the right hand to put into it so if you know if it's just a coincidence that you had ace five suited there i don't like it as much but you know if, if part of the reason why you chose to make that play is that you had ace five suited i think that's uh that's good um okay so this is the last of the hands that we're zooming in on i think defending a six off suit from the big blind especially against a late position raiser is good getting like four and a half to one um maybe a fold against an early position raise but late position raiser should have a pretty wide range and one of the implications of him, of him having a wide range is that you actually have a lot of showdown value on this flop, right? Even some of the better hands in his range are going to be hands like king, queen, king, jack, and he'll also have stuff like jack nine suited and whatnot. So um, there's actually, you know, you can you can win unimproved with this hand. So my plan here would be to check call rather than try to like check raise as a semi bluff. I think this this hand will play pretty well as, as a check call. Um, when he checks behind, I would assume, similar to one of the other hands that we discussed already, I wouldn't expect a lot of slow playing here. I think this is the kind of board where people are are you know afraid of the draw, maybe more than they should be, and I don't think that you're going to see him check behind very often. So I think that, um, or not very often with a strong hand. Um, so I think there's a... Pr there's an even better chance now that your ace six is good. However, I do also think hands like ace king, ace queen, ace jack are going to do some checking behind, but it is nice that you block those. So I think overall, you know, I'm still not really feeling like you need to turn your hand into a bluff here. I, um, I, I think, I don't know if you've seen my, um, my bluffing series on Tournament Poker Edge, but if you haven't, I would recommend looking at it because the question that I want to ask you now is, what's your target? In other words, what is the hand that you're trying to make him fold? I suspect, similar to with the ace-king hand, you're just sort of thinking, um, I really hope he folds, and not thinking about what exactly it is you're trying to get him off of. I don't see him, if he did check behind a pair on the flop, I don't see him folding it now. Exceptions to that might be pocket twos, threes, and fours. But um, a lot of the, like, to the extent that you're going to make him fold a hand better than yours, it's just going to be those very weak pocket pairs or maybe some unimproved ace highs. And I think that you don't really need to bet this much if you're going to bet at all. So if you're bluffing, I mean, if, if, if you can articulate, and I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that you're going to get him to fold, you know, ace seven or, or pocket you know, kings or something if you did check those. So I, I just, I don't think that you really need to be betting this much against the hands that you can realistically bluff him off of. And I think once you start thinking about what is the target, what am I trying to make him fold, it becomes a little more obvious why this is not the best sizing to choose. I, but again, I think your hand has enough showdown value that you should just be looking to check and call. I think you have, you have a pretty good bluff catcher here, actually. So I would, I would not be turning this into a bluff, period. Um, when he calls you, I think that's bad news, and I don't think the king is a real good card for you to barrel. I mean, what really can you represent here? Um, you could have hit the five. You could, I mean, I guess there's a fair number of strong hands you could have. Um, yeah, maybe let me back off that a little bit. I, I, it's true that you can't really represent much King X, but I don't know that you need to. I think like what you're representing here isn't really that you hit the King, but rather that you have trips or, or a straight or, or a full house or something like that. Um, again, though, I want you to think about what's your target. What is the hand that he could have called the turn with that is now going to fold the river? I think that a lot of those hands are going to be um, maybe a pair with a six, a hand like seven, six or eight, six where uh, you know, he, had a, he had a pair in a draw and now the draw didn't get there on the river. You may not need to bet this big to get him off of hands like those. More importantly though, you block hands like those. So when you hold a six, you're less likely to run into seven, six or eight, six. So running a bluff 
with a six in your hand where the bluff is designed to make him fold a hand like seven six or eight six is not a real good idea because you're going to run into the stronger hands in his range or the non-folding hands in his range more often because you're, you're blocking some of the hands that you're trying to make him fold as a result of holding that six um so i just really don't, i think that you're going to end up bluffing like it's not that the turn is a terrible spot to bluff with any hand this just isn't a hand that's good for it and i kind of feel the same way about the river i don't hate barreling here i might use smaller sizing for it but i i don't really like using this hand for it um yeah, so I mean, this this is a great example where he actually didn't even on the turn didn't fold that hand that uh, like I just don't I don't think you're going to make him fold very many better hands if he's not even folding ace king with with your turn bet and you know maybe he would have folded the ace king if this river had been a queen instead but then again maybe he wouldn't have you know I think that's actually a reasonable hand for him to call down twice with because there's a lot of draws that you could semi bluff with especially if you're bluffing with a hand that's not even that great for bluffing so if you're bluffing with like all better bluffing candidates than a6 and also a6 your bluffing frequency is going to be really high and this is actually a pretty reasonable call down from him so I think what happened here is you kind of um did did too much bluffing or you know have, have an exploitably wide bluffing range here and your opponent either predicted that you would or you know just just happened to choose a a strategy that involved a high calling down frequency and you ended up getting punished for that so this is part of the reason why you don't want to bet a6 on the turn you might well have gotten a free river card as a result of checking um and in any event, you would have avoided putting in a lot of money bad. And so you can imagine if he's not folding ace-king, like the only hands that he is folding are hands that you're ahead of anyway. Not that there's no value in making him fold something like queen-jack, but there's not that much value. Um, so I, th I think this is kind of an illustrative hand and for, for why this is not a good bluffing candidate. Um, all right, let me pause again, and we will jump ahead to the beginning of the final three tables. All right, so this is the final three tables. I think we'll be watching every hand at this point, although I'm still going to skip past uh, once we see that you're not playing the hand, or even if I just suspect that you're not going to play the hand, um, I'll skip past them in the interest of being able to cover more hands more quickly. I uh, like the open with ace nine offsuit there. The ace blocker is real valuable. And I mean, having the, having the big card is nice as well. Um, I wouldn't have hated even an open with king 10 offsuit there. Just looking at these stack sizes behind you, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a bad fold. I mean, I think it's pretty close between raising or, or folding, but I'll tell you the, the case for raising. With these stack sizes, I, I actually think you're not going to get through that very much at all, just because most people have um, like 20K, which when you only risk, if, if you can just raise to 2,000, which, which is what I would recommend, um, they have to take a pretty big risk. Like for someone, you know, Leggy Bluffs or Everfla to, um, to jam on you, you know, they've got to put 20,000 chips at risk in order to win 4,500. So they've got to risk like four times the pot. And there's a lot of players still left to act after them. So it's not that easy for one of these three players to just ship on you with uh, Ace-9 offsuit or something. Um, you know, maybe Bob or Penny rates up with a hand. Maybe one of these two players wakes up with a hand. Um, Mudo Mulo seems to have um, slightly tight stats. So I, I can see some arguments for opening here. And we're not really nine-handed. We're eight-handed, which helps. So I, I don't hate the fold. I mean, this is one of the worst hands I would consider opening there. But um, I, I wouldn't hope it. I would not hate it if you wanted to raise that. Um... I, I suspect there, there's, there's some chance if, if you've been watching my uh, TP videos that I might actually be responsible for this call. I, I do advocate defending pretty aggressively from the big blind. This might be pushing it though. Um, I, being this shallow helps. I still think you're going to have a hard time realizing equity with 8-5 offsuit because so often you're going to end up making bottom pair and it's you're going to have a hard time taking that to showdown. Uh, I would say when in doubt, like fold this. If you, if you don't feel very confident in your ability to play post-flop against this player. I mean, 8-5 suited, I would definitely call here. 8-6 off suit, I would probably even call. So it's got to be pretty close. But um, I, I think this is a weak enough hand that you can just fold it to a late position raise. That said, you know, if he's going to give you a lot of free cards like this, um, so, I mean, this is the kind of scenario that makes me like uh, having 8-5 off suit here if, if, if he's going to allow these sorts of free cards. Um, I might actually consider bluffing the river. And that's because your hand is 
so weak. There's really not much. Although, I guess you could actually have weaker than this. So, I mean, I think that you should have a little bit of a bluffing range on the river, and you can have a little bit of a value betting range as well. Like, if I had a good ace that I didn't three bet pre flop, um, whatever the best ace would be, let's say ace nine or ace eight offsuit, I actually think that's a hand you can value bet on the river. And uh, I think that you can do a bit of bluffing in this spot as well, but not very much, and it should be with an extremely weak hand. 8-5 offsuit actually might not even be weak enough because it is possible for you to have a hand like 5-3 or 5-6, although I might bet those on the turn. Um, but so where I'm going with this is that obviously Vasilek is not going to fold any kind of um, good hand. Like I, I wouldn't expect him to fold an ace, maybe not even a king. And I'm not talking about betting very much. I would bet something like 1,500. So I don't think he's going to fold, probably not even a king. I wouldn't even be shocked to get called by queen high. However, if he has hands like 10 high and eight, 10 high and 9 high, and uh, I guess you will chop with an 8. So this is why I'm, I'm really emphasizing that you want to have a, a very weak hand, like you know 7 high would be a better bluffing candidate than 8 high. But then this comes back to the idea of thinking about your bluffing target again. There's, there actually is room, I think, to make him fold some better hands when your hand is extremely weak. Like, you should choose your bluffing range from the very, very weakest hands in your range. And I think 8-5 offsuit actually, <laughs> this is a weird thing to say, I think this might actually have a little too much showdown value to bluff with. Um, so that's that's fine. I mean, I, that's not a super important diversion, but I just think it, it dovetails with some of the other stuff we've already discussed about bluffing ranges and bluffing targets. So I thought I would I would mention there um, that even though I might not bluff with that hand, it's, it's close to a hand that I would want to bluff with. And my suspicion is that even if you had like 7-3 offsuit there, you might not have bluffed. And I think that you should with that hand. Uh, good. Sizing seems fine. Uh, that's a nice turn card. So let's think about what it means that he was willing to check and call your flop bet. Um, I think it probably indicates either that he's on a draw of some sort or that he has some kind of showdown value. Um, his showdown value could be pretty weak. Maybe the weakest it could be would be something like king high. Um, you know, there's a chance he just like randomly calls you with queen 10 or something, but I don't think that's so likely. So I think you know, in all likelihood he probably has either hearts. Um, you block a lot of the straight draws, so 2-5, five, 5-6, five, not so likely for him. Uh, ace two could be in his range. Um, it, you know, a lot of his pocket pairs, he's probably three betting pre flop, but you know, outside chance he has a pocket pair or he paired the four. I could see a lot of ace x being in his range as well, and I think most of those are our hands are going to be willing to call another bet on the turn. Especially, you know, it doesn't have to be a big bet. In fact, I would say it shouldn't be a big bet because you really don't want him to fold a hand like a heart draw or, or ace x that is you know drawing dead and has some serious reverse implied odds if it actually hits you know a straight or a flush or something. Um, but I, I definitely think you should bet something on the turn. Perfect. Great. I think that's that's very good. Uh, definitely do not three bet against the check raise. Um, I think any hand, yeah, that's... Um, I mean, it may not matter very much because I don't know if he's going to have a, a check raising, a, a, a bluffing range here, but I think that... Um, you want to give him room. Like well, any hand that's going to call a shove from you right now, I think is going to shove the river anyway. If you just call and you, you know, leave thirty k in his stack, thirty k in the pot. I really, if he's check raising for value, I can't see very many rivers. I mean, I guess if he has a three, and the river is like a heart or a six or a deuce, he'll get away from it. I just think overall, like giving him room to bluff again on the river if he's bluffing is probably better than shipping it in now. But if you really feel confident that he doesn't, that he's just never going to be bluffing here, I guess shipping it is fine. But you know, see, he was. Um, and I think that's going to happen when you use the small bet sizing. And I think that you should give him room to, you know, like he might be semi bluffing here with a flush draw. And then, you know, you really want to give him room to bluff again on the river or to get there on the river. So I think this is, it, this is a pretty important spot to slow play rather than just, uh, just jam it all in. And yeah, I mean, you just, you don't have much to lose in this case. A lot of the hands that are going to be willing to call this shove are going to stick the money in it on at least most rivers anyway. Some of them as bluffs, some of them for value. You just don't, um... You don't lose very much by calling there and, and shoving you know you you potentially lost 30k that he would have put in as a bluff on the next street or even if he wouldn't have bet at all he probably would have bet something as a bluff i think at least on a lot of rivers Good. I like that you didn't three bet that. I think against an under the gun open at this stage of the tournament, I don't know that I'm. I, I, I don't think you should be real excited to, to get in with this end. 
Uh, I would probably peel this. It's a bit close, especially if he's, yeah, we don't really have any reads on how often he's continuation betting. I think you should peel this. I think, you know, a jack is obviously a good card for you. Spades are pretty good. Even an ace or a queen could easily give you the best hand. So I like that you're calling there. Um, shoving is tempting, except that this just doesn't feel to me like a spot where he is going to have much of a bet folding range. I just, with his stack size and the way the board is running out, um, I don't really know what his bet folding range would look like, but uh, I definitely would not hate shoving here. For somewhat exploitive reasons, I would probably just call, yeah, just I just don't see him doing much folding. Um, now, for the same reasons, I don't think you should try to bluff the river. I think, you know, it's, uh, wow. Um, I So I think, I actually think there's a decent chance that you had the best hand anyway. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I just don't know what pair he would bet again on the turn and then check fold the river. Like if he had a king, I think enough draws missed that he's going to check call a bet of like 8,500. So this, this again strikes me as an instance where um, if he's folding, like I actually think you have some showdown value here. And I think you're just looking at this hand as, oh, I missed my draw. But he might have two clubs. He might have ace jack. He might have queen jack. He might have ace queen, which I mean, it's you do benefit by making him fold ace queen, but not that much because you're going to get half the pot anyway. And you know, obviously, you you lose eighty five hundred when um, when when he calls you with a better hand. So yeah, I, I just I just think once again, this is a hand that's too good to turn into a bluff. You know, do your bluffing with queen jack. Do your bluffing with busted clubs where you don't have any showdown value, and take the showdown value that, that's in this hand because when you do run into these players who are calling you know, with a good frequency or even too high of a frequency, uh, as we saw with that ace king call down, your this this kind of bluffing strategy is going to cost you money if you're bluffing with the wrong kinds of hands. <clears throat> I think it's good that I came across that hand because it's the kind of thing that, um, you know, because it, it sort of worked from your perspective, like he folded, which is what you wanted. I, I'm guessing that that didn't even um, really strike you as a mistake. Or you, I mean, you might have even looked at that hand and thought, oh, hey, I played that really well because I won the pot and he folded to my bluff. Uh, and and it's the kind of, like, it just, it doesn't jump out at you as a mistake because you don't see how you cost yourself money. But I would argue that you did. That seems fine, just a cooler, obviously. Seeing the flop wouldn't have changed the outcome there at all. But yeah, I think I think shoving that is certainly better than just calling. <clears throat> uh, this is pretty suspicious that Lakey Bluffs just flats you and does not have very like so I mean sometimes if a player has a high V pip, I'm just well that guy's probably just a fish and he's calling way too much pre-flop. This player does not play very many hands pre-flop. He usually raises them when he plays, and now all of a sudden he's decided he wants to, you know, just just call off well over 10% of his stack. Uh, this strikes me as very, very suspicious. Um, that said, I do think Kings is in his range for doing this, and I, I'm definitely not betting here. That, that's the first thing. I absolutely do not want to bet into this guy. Um, I think we're kind of hoping for a cheap showdown, maybe even trying to squeeze a little bit of value bet on the river if it goes checked twice. But yeah, I'm very happy that you're not betting the flop. Um, I actually don't think the nine is relevant. I think that this player has either aces or kings, and turning two pair really does not make a difference. Uh, I still, and, I, and if he does actually have a dominated ace, you know, if he had something like ace king, which I really can't see him playing this way, but if for some reason he had ace king and, and you're hitting the nine actually matters, you're not going to need to bet to get value from that. He's going to do the value betting for you. So I actually see no reason to bet here. Uh, oh, I, I certainly don't see a reason to pot it. Um, Similar to what I've said about the the having a target for your bluffs, you need to have some kind of target for your value bets. And I just don't see like what it is that you think, like what you're trying to get him to call with. Or I mean, this is, he's only got 18k. You don't, you know, you're going to end up. You're betting full pot now. If he calls you, you're going to end up with 24k in the pot and 10,000 in the stacks, and then you're going to end up betting 40% a pot on the river. I would much rather see you, even if you're going to, you know, plan to bet twice with with this hand. I'd much rather see you bet a similar fraction of the pot on both streets rather than betting full pot on the on the turn and then betting 40% pot on the river. I think there's a very good chance you just set pocket kings and. Um, for you to get value from that, I think the best thing to do is to check now, 
maybe he bets the turn. Um, if he has Ace King, he probably will bet the turn anyway. So if he actually has the, the value target, the hand you want him to have, you're going to get um, paid anyway. But most likely, it's going to go check check again, and then you can make a small bet on the river. And, and again, like you need to think in terms of value targets. I think pocket kings, just based on his action, is is the hand you should be thinking of. And you need to think about how you're not going to get pocket kings to call a river bet. It's going to have to be a small bet. So I, I think you cost yourself something making such a big bet there. Um, and part of the thing you're costing yourself is that you know sometimes he's going to have pocket aces and. Um, and you're going to end up losing some money. That's not going to happen real often, but that's that's part of the hidden cost of that play. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's better than shoving on him, especially he doesn't have real aggressive stats. Yeah, I like the trick calling here. You should be doing a lot of check folding, but uh, obviously not on this flop. Um, that said, I don't know that I want to check raise here either. So if he had bet, I think I would probably just check call. And I think a lot of the hands that are going to call a check raise are going to keep betting anyway, and you want to give them a chance to bluff or turn something, etc. Um, no, so what to do now that it's gone check check on the flop? I think that he is you know, most likely to have either a hand that missed the flop, you know, ace king, ace jack or a, a pair lower than a queen, whether that's pairing the 10 or whether it's a low pocket pair. So I think that your value targets are not particularly strong hands. And I wouldn't, I guess I could see either betting half the pot or checking again as a sort of slow play, give them room to bluff, give them room to value bet a few hands that weren't good enough to value bet on the flop, give them room to improve to something on the, on the river. I think all those things are fine. Um, I think betting big is not great. I just don't think he has very many hands in his range that are going to call a big bet. Um, I think that you still have to go for value on the river. Uh, again, I think it's going to be tough for you to bet big because you should have a lot of flushes in your range as well. Um, I think you know, for, for making a bet like that on the turn, having a flush draw is a very good hand to do that with. So. Um, your, your range is now quite strong. You know, it consists of all the hands you were value betting on the turn, plus all of your hands that turn into flushes. And you're not going to be bluffing in the spot very often. I think like Jack-9 and, and you know, King-Jack, I guess, are like the only two hands I can really see you bluffing with here. So I think you're going to have to offer your opponent pretty good pot odds to call you on the river, but I definitely think you should value bet. Um, I think that as long as you make it small enough, you will have incentive to call you. I do think you have the best hand most of the time. And again, you know, I, I'm not... Well, let's see what you do. Uh, okay, so you, you went for the shove. Um, I, I I can kind of understand why you would do that. It might even work, but um, I think if it works, it's going to be because he's he's overly loose and, and kind of reluctant to fold on the river. But I think especially at this point in the tournament, threatening his survival is really not the best way to get to get paid. I think this is just a spot where you have a really strong range, and, and you have to compensate for that by offering your opponent enticing odds on a call. Otherwise, he's just going to correctly fold really, really often to you. <clears throat> I like that open, especially because you can feel, I mean, I'm not excited to have Leggy Bluff shove on me, but uh, you can deal with it, you know. Um, this is a little bit similar to the ace-king hand that we looked at where you three bet, uh, in that I think that this is not a good hand for betting once and then giving up. Once again, there's actually a decent chance that you have the best hand here, and I would probably check behind. If you choose to bet with this, it should be with the intention of firing multiple barrels, at least if the turn is a heart. Um, you have, you, have a, you have a pretty decent hand for multi-barreling, or you have a decent hand for trying to check and show down or check and bluff later streets or whatever. I don't think you have a good one and done kind of bluffing hand. Um, so you know, once again, I think there's a, there's a pretty good chance that when you bet here, you had the best, or you know, when he folds, it means that you had the best hand anyway, which is still, I mean, it's nicer to win the pot than not, but um, there's, there's a lot less value in taking a pot away from a hand that you are probably going to beat anyway. And of course, when he doesn't fold, then you're not in good shape anymore. So there, there is a downside to it. It's not just like a free roll. If, I mean, if you knew for sure you had the best hand, it would kind of be a free roll, I guess, to bet. But um, given that you could also run into better hands, there, there is a cost associated with it. And, and what I'm saying is that the whatever you gain from betting in terms of locking up a pot that probably belonged to you anyway, uh, it's 
is not that valuable compared to you know how how far behind you probably are against this calling range. Um, kind of close actually, I think between betting and checking. And the reason I say that is that um, I don't. You know, th this is definitely not a hand that's good enough to bet three times for value. You're not going to go you know bet flop turn river all the way. So you're going to have to check some street, and it's worth thinking right away about which street is going to be good for you to check. Are you going to go bet check bet 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 check check bet bet? Um, I, I could see a case for doing check bet bet. Uh, I, it's, it's not that you won't be ahead of his flop calling range. You will. He'll call with queens. He'll call with flush draws, straight draws maybe. And there are some turn cards that will make your action kind of difficult. I would definitely bet if I had a king with a better kicker. I think kings with weak kickers can um, can play pretty nicely as check backs. Nice. Okay. I like that you did that. Um, very good. Definitely want to start betting now. And I think you can bet pretty big at this point. I think with him checking to you again on the turn, it's extremely likely that you have the best hand. You've weakened your range a lot by checking the flop, which is good in this case, because you actually have an extremely strong hand and you've represented weakness after checking the flop. So unlike in some of the previous instances where you made big bets and I was saying it was not good to do that um, for value, this is a spot where I think you should make a big bet for value. Let's see what we end up getting. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. I could even see going a little bigger than that. Uh, 6,000, 6,500, but that's good. I, I like that you're substantially over half pot. I think you're you're um, you're on the right track here. This this is this is one of the best hands I see. In fact, I would say this is the best hand I've seen you play. I think you avoided some of the same some of the pitfalls that I've seen you fall into in uh, other hands that you've played. So that was that was very good to see. I actually think it's a nice thing to do um, to have kind of a portfolio of well-played hands. And I don't know if that you know, deserves to be in one of your all-time best hands, but have an idea of um, what does it look like when you're really playing great poker? You know, what, what does your A game look like? What does it feel like? What are the things that you're doing when, when you're on your A game? And I think that can be a nice thing to review at the start of a session or you know, certainly when you're in a downswing or any time when either you're, you're looking to pump yourself up or, or if you're you know, having a bit of a crisis of confidence, which is... Uh, very common for tournament players, still happens to me from time to time. Um, I, it can be nice to kind of remind yourself what you're capable of when you're at your best and maybe even help you to get into the mindset where you, where you will play your best, play your A game. Uh, very often as, as poker players, I think we tend to just focus on our mistakes. And you know, obviously it is important to review and learn from your mistakes, but if the only hands that you ever review are hands that you played badly, it's easy to get this sort of negative self-image of yourself as like, I always make the same mistakes, I'm such a big fish, why do I always do this? I think it's nice to also look at some hands that you played well and not just give yourself negative reinforcement of, don't do that again, you idiot, but also give yourself some, hey, remember what you're capable of, look at how good you can play when, when you're really at your best and thinking about what you're trying to accomplish instead of just clicking buttons. Uh, I like the open with a7 offsuit with these people behind you being so short like alley poker um, you know you, you've got to have a hand that will have a have okay equity if alley chooses to shove which you do having the blocker is really nice um, and there's a lot of pressure as we get close to the final table on people with alley poker just calling you you know we've talked about this before but I think you've got to be very wary of what this range looks like I mean she's not a really loose player so the fact that she chose to call off such a big percentage of her stack should be suspicious and i don't think you should be trying to bluff her on the flop um i would actually be looking to check behind the flop i wouldn't fold this particular turn card but i would be doing a lot of check folding and yeah she, so you you fell into a trap and you got lucky despite the ace but i think that this this is this is something you should be able to sniff out and say to yourself hey you're not going to catch me right I, I i know that you have an extremely strong hand here and i'm not going to put another chip in the pot unless i hit an ace even hitting a seven on the turn i think you should be folding Uh, I like that fold, even though you would have got there. Would have gotten there. That's interesting. Um, it's been a whole lot of three betting from him. So the way I think about this is we're going to have to call 6,000 to see a flop, and I want to be able to win 60,000 when I make a set on average. Um, so there is going to be just about 60,000 in your stack, 
but there's also already 15k in the pot so you really only need to win another 45k when you actually get there um just doing that that 10 to 1 thing so i and i think that ever flaws three betting range is going to be pretty strong and that his stack is going to go in most of the time after the flop so i think you can call here and set mine um i would fold to this bet though i think that I understand the temptation to call. You are getting pretty decent odds, and if he's gonna just you know one and done give up, that's then I guess it's actually okay to call here. The problem is his range contains so many big pairs that he can also really effectively bluff with his you know ace king hands and um, put a lot of pressure on a hand like pocket sevens. And you really shouldn't be getting this hand to showdown very much. If you go to showdown and win with this hand, it's because your opponent made a mistake and, and didn't put enough pressure on you with whatever we can was in his range. Um, I also would not bet here, unless you're very, very confident that he would not check an overpair. But getting check raised here is a pretty big disaster for you, especially because you have a gut shot as well. <clears throat> um, and if you are ahead, he's drawing to six outs, and you have a pretty good idea of what those cards are. So you really don't have a lot to fear from seeing the river. Um, there's about a 12% chance that an ace or, I mean, if he has ace king, there's a 12% chance there's going to be an ace or king on the river, and you're not going to pay him off when it comes. Um, so I, I, it feels to me like you're really just betting here for protection. And the problem is that um, when he, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess he might actually be calling you here with a hand worse than sevens. Uh, I don't, I, I guess you're trying to turn this into a bluff at this point and represent that you hit the 10 to get him off of a better overpair. I just, uh, this strikes me as another one of these spots where... So I actually was actually thinking when he check calls the turn, you're probably ahead. I mean, I think if he had aces, he would just check shove. I don't know why he would check call like this. So I think that his check call probably represents like an ace king that he didn't want to check shove, but decided to call because he was, he was getting a good price. Um, and I think that now here on the river, this is just um, when he folds, you were going to win anyway. When he doesn't fold, you're in a world of hurt. Uh, in fact, you're out of the tournament. So I think this is, uh, again, this is one of those ones that maybe it felt to you like it worked because he, he did the thing that you were hoping that he would do. But I actually think this is a pretty big mistake. Uh, I don't think he's folding very many better hands. Um, and I, I think he probably just had Ace King there. So again, like don't don't turn a hand that straight. So one thing that I think is clear is that that's not a value bet. Um, I, I think I think that you were thinking of that as a bluff, but I don't think you should be turning a hand that strong into a bluff. That's a hand that has a good amount of showdown value, and, and I think you should just take that. I also think you should fold the flop. Although the fact that I mean, if he did have Ace King there, he made the sort of mistake that makes calling the flop correct. So then the question is, did you know or, or have reason to believe he was going to make that mistake? If he had just, um, you know, bet the flop, shoved the turn with the ace king, which is what I think he should have done, then uh, you would, you know, you would regret that flop call with pocket sevens, and that's you know how you should be playing ace king in that same spot. Uh, what are the stacks here? Uh, I think this is too good of a hand to just shove. Um, I think that your hand is actually good enough to raise call. The reason I say that is that he's not going to fold ace queen anyway. So when you shove here. Um, this is uh, this is really a theme that's come up a lot. When you shove here, he's not going to fold better hands. He's not going to fold a pocket pair. He's not going to fold ace queen. So all that you're doing by shoving here is causing him to fold hands worse than yours. Um, I would suggest raising to um, six thousand personally. You could even go to eight if you are really averse to playing a flop. But I think raising to six thousand is um, you really you want to give him room to limp shove on you. I, I suspect that you're not thinking of it that way. That you're you're kind of saying I just want to win those chips that are out there right now. But realistically, against his limp shoving range, your ace jack is in real nice shape. His limp shoving range is going to include dominated aces, some dominated jacks. Sometimes it'll be hands that are live. There'll be king queen or something in there, and, and you'll have to race. But you are ahead. I mean, ace jack is ahead of king queen, and it's way ahead of ace five. It's way ahead of ace. 10, way ahead of Jack 10 suited. So giving him room to jam with his hands is, is really nice for you. And yeah, it entails taking a little bit of risk. Sometimes um, he's you know he's gonna jam a hand like King Queen, but even then, like you are at least a little bit ahead of that. Um, and uh, most importantly, like so maybe you're thinking, well, if I raise to six thousand and he shows, like what if he has ace queen? Well, if he has ace queen, you're gonna be putting in 45k anyway. So you gotta give him a chance to put it in with hands that are worse than yours. I think ace jack is, is too strong in a you know, blind versus blind kind of spot to, to just ship it in there. You you gotta give him room to make more of a mistake than just you know, losing a thousand chips. <clears throat> I like that res. Excuse me. I like that res. 
this is I suppose this is good um, you're in kind of a I mean I guess you'll just fall to a shot from Everfla but uh, <clears throat> I think it's tough for Bob to shove here and, and I think we're at the final two tables now um, Sorry, I was not. Yeah, that, that's definitely a good flop to, to bet. Um, I, I was just looking at your email for a second. But yeah, I think like <clears throat> betting here is really good because uh, you have a clear value target, which is an ace, and you're not blocking it at all. My only concern is that Everflaw is probably jamming a lot of his ace x pre flop. So given how shallow you are, I could actually find a case for checking this because I don't think he has a lot of ace x. If you were deeper, I would 100% like, bet like betting the flop. I still don't mind it too much. I just think. You are blocking a lot. If, if we assume that he's shoving most or all of his aces pre-flop, then you're actually not going to get action here very often when you bet the flop. But you're, probably, you're not going to get very much action by checking either, so it kind of doesn't matter. I do like that you use small sizing. I think that's good. Uh, so according to you, we are now in the money, and we are at the final two tables of the tournament. Um, I think this is a good one to see bet. Even though you don't have any kind of, well, you do have a backdoor straight draw actually, and he'll have some lower pocket pairs in his range where you've got uh, where your two over cards are actually live. The problem with checking is that I don't think your hand is good enough to call a bet, and so he can just bet and take the pot away from you with worse hands and also with hands that you have some equity again. So I think I would rather see about the flop. I don't hate check folding um, and just trying to like check it down like this. Okay, so I mean, he's happy to check it down because he had ace nine. I think there's a good chance he wouldn't have folded that on the flop anyway. I wouldn't if I were him. So not the end of the world. But I actually think this is one. You know, I've 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 given you crap about some of your continuation bets. I think that's a hand where you know, there is actually a chance of making him fold better, such as making him fold ace nine suited. You know, like you don't have as much showdown value with king queen as you would if you had ace queen there, and um, and and the king queen does have some equity against his calling range, which again might include ace nine. Um. I would probably open this. I mean, I think you can call a shove. Yeah, you can call a shove from like Slim, Everfla, or Hale. Uh, I know it's right after the bubble broke, so people are maybe a little bit more gambly, but Queen Jack suited plays really nicely with um, with stacks this shallow where you don't have to fold away your equity to a shove because it does have good equity against people shoving ranges. Not a big deal, but I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the worst hands I would open. <clears throat> That I like. I mean, the, the difference between this and the hand against Mulo where you had the ace jack is that Mulo actually had room. Um, if you, like there was, there's room for you to have a raise folding range against his limps. Whereas against Bob, you're never going to raise fold. So you might as well just go all in with your whole range. That's, that's the important difference. And you know, you're, so you can't expect that to like induce something from him. Whereas you know, Mulo actually does have some incentive to limp raise on you because you should have some hands that are raising and, and fold into a shove. And then Ace Jack, you know, goes into your limb calling range. I had a feeling that was coming. Um, not bad, I guess. I mean, you've got you've got a good like stack situation here to leverage him. Even though I think he does technically outchip you, like you are a, a very big threat to him it's a pretty good spot for him to open with you know, the stack sizes and the players in the big blind and whatnot you've got the suited ace uh, i do think in terms of you know not overdoing this i would like this a little bit better if you had like ace five suited or ace four suited instead but it's a it's a very minor difference um good flop for you well, i mean not great flop for you but i think it's a it's a flop worth continuation betting because he probably will have some small pairs that are going to fold he might even have like ace queen that's going to fold or ace king, he might choose not to four bet. Um, you've got the gut shot, you've got the backdoor draw. I know you don't have a gut shot, but you do have a backdoor draw. Um, you block eight seven, which is nice. So yeah, I like that. Definitely like that. In part because you really don't have to care when, um, well, I, yeah, so you don't have to care when, when Penny three bets you. Um, this, I guess you're getting good enough odds to call in position. The problem is 10 9 suited is not a hand that plays that well on a short stacked kind of spot, and he does not have a real aggressive three bet percent. He's just going to have a lot of big pairs in his in his three bet range. 
and it's pretty tough for you to continue even when you like even when you flop top pair you don't have that much equity this is a real easy flop for you to just fold um, you should not put a penny into the pot now do, I, I really don't think this is a good idea um, do, like what what is it that, that you're trying to get him like what hands do you think he's three betting pre-flop and then check folding here like kings queens um, I don't know what happened there that's I, I don't like that bet I, I honestly, I, I'm not even thrilled about the, the preflop call. I think it's okay. Um, I would, I mean, I definitely call if we were deeper. You're getting okay odds in position. I just think his range there has to be really strong for the preflop three bet. And uh, I'm actually quite surprised that he folded. I mean, I, I don't see what if he had a hand worse than queens there, he should have been bluffing with it himself. Um, so he's like, I really don't think he should have much of a check folding range. And I, I think he got pretty lucky there that he that he folded that. And the reason I'm, I'm highlighting these so hard, as I've mentioned, is I just think it's easy to get the wrong kind of reinforcement with bluffs, where just because someone folds, you know, doesn't doesn't mean that you made a good bluff for a variety of reasons. And that's why I kind of want to highlight those more so than some other hands where, you know, maybe you, you might have realized that you made a mistake or you knew that you weren't sure what you were supposed to do. It's the kind of thing where you can end up um, thinking that you played it really well. Uh, that's awesome if he's willing to fold with <laughs> that much of his stack in the pot. Uh, I mean, good good time for you to raise him with almost any two anyway, even even if you knew he was going to call it off, but certainly if he's not going to. Okay, now I decided to make a stand. That's fine. Obviously, he got lucky to pick up a hand that strong. Uh, I might even open the queen eight suited there. Mm, no, I guess not. Yeah, that's a good fold. Oh, <laughs> I just assumed you were going to fold that. Let's see. Not ordinarily a good hand for opening under the gun. And yeah, this. I mean, are we at the final table bubble? No, there's seven people at the table. Um, yeah, I, I don't think you can do this. I know his stack seems good for it, but you've got to worry about like, AL or Penny waking up with hands and Queen 4 offsuit is going to play really bad. Like you're going to have to call them and Queen 4 off is going to play really badly against them. You don't have any kind of blocker value. The thing is you're not just playing against the player in the big blind, right? There's one, two, three, four, five other players who all get to wake up with strong hands as well. And if any of them does, you're going to be in, in bad shape. So, I mean, I, I do like raising aggressively in that spot, but Queen 4 offsuit is really aggressive. I think that's that's taking it too far. Yeah, I'm pretty happy to stick it in there with tens. Um, let's say. I think you should just be shoving here. Uh, I don't know if maybe you're trying to give yourself room to give a, to get away if Bob shoves, but I don't think that's a good idea. He's going to have a lot of ace king or ace queen maybe in his range. Um, I think it's more important for you to shove here. You might even push him off of jacks by shoving. You're definitely going to push him, I think, off of like ace king or ace queen um or you i mean you definitely want to push him off of ace queen giving giving bob five to one to call here is pretty bad for you as opposed he's going to fold almost always when you shove when he doesn't he's probably going to shove anyway um the betting is open for him so if he has a hand better than yours he's going to shove it anyway and i don't think you can fold to a shove so i think you should just fold here you should just shove here and take whatever fold equity you can get against bob you really don't want to let him come into the pot for those ten thousand chips I think it's going to end up costing you the pot pretty often. Um, I also think you should bet the flop now. You really don't want to give him a free card to just you know, pick something up. I think you get pretty lucky there that that's not uh, an over card to your pair. Um, I can actually see that fold making sense. I, I, I just really wish you had shoved pre-flop. I mean, I do have a bad feeling about this shove. At the same time, you're getting a pretty good price. Um, and this is, this is a gross spot to be in. I, I really, really just wish you had shoved preflop. Yeah, I mean, that that's why this is such a bad, like, this is why you want to shove the tens preflop. It's why you don't necessarily want to fold the turn. It's why you want to bet the flop. Um, this is an example of one of those hands where I think you probably did realize um, that you made a mistake and why you made a mistake. But yeah, it's uh, just, just shove preflop. It feels like maybe that, that again was related to not having a lot of confidence in your hand and so thinking like maybe I'll just call in, in case Bob has a better hand. But then that's why I'm emphasizing that I don't think you can fold 
um, to a preflop shove from Bob anyway. And so if he has a better hand, he has a better hand. Like there's, there's nothing you can do to avoid paying that off. It's, it's going to happen sometimes and, and you're not going to be able to dance around it because what ended up happening to you instead was a, was a huge disaster for you to, to fold the best hand in a, in a pot of that size. I, I know some of it was a, was a main pot that you weren't going to win anyway, but still, you know, folding when you when you would have stacked Bob is a, is pretty bad. Uh, so he calls from the small blind. He should have a pretty strong range for doing that, and yeah, I would definitely start value betting right away. I don't I don't see him doing a lot of check folding on the flop. One thing to keep in mind, though, in, in terms of your sizing, this I actually think you should be sizing bigger than this. If anything, um, this is kind of suspicious, and I mean, not that he's really going to get away, but it's not giving you room. We'll see if you manage to get stacks in by the river. Okay, he's just going to check shove anyway. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. So I guess you did induce something spazzy from him by using that small sizing. I'll leave you alone about that. I like that. So I think I mean, you can comfortably get in against Penny. You've got a blocker. If Peza shoves, you just fold. So perfect. I like the A6. <clears throat> and that's the best way to play Jack-5. I like that. Although I wonder... You might actually be better off just open shoving here. If this is the final table bubble, which it must be, yeah, I think open shoving here is it might actually be the best play because you are like you don't want to do a lot of raise folding against these players because they actually can jam pretty profitably against you. Um, this is one of those spots where I think you want to put the ICM pressure on them by just open shoving. I mean, you wouldn't ordinarily open shove this much, but um, because you don't really, really want to raise call. And they have a lot of incentive to jam on you. Like King Nine also probably has more equity than you would think against their jamming ranges. And they're gonna have a hard time calling it like even if one of them has like pocket sixes, they can't really feel too good about calling your shove. So you're gonna have a lot of fold equity on a shove. I, I think shoving I think there's a good chance shoving is the best play there. I like that you didn't raise that. Certainly should raise that. Oh yeah, so here's an example of him um, leveraging the ICM thing. And this might not be a call for you, actually. I, I, I'm wondering if maybe you're assuming that he wouldn't do this with any hands that you dominate, which I'm not sure is true. I think he might play hands, I'm mean, sorry, any hands that dominate you, but I think he might play hands like ace-queen or ace-jack this way. And I don't know that it's gonna be profitable for him to play a lot of hands. Like, Maybe he plays ace nine this way. I don't know about ace eight, so I, I don't really see you being in very good shape. I think his range here might be something like ace nine through ace queen and pocket pairs, and I don't think you're in very good shape against. I mean, pocket pairs that are capped at some point, maybe even lower than a ten, but I don't think you're in good enough shape against that range that you really want to call this. Okay, I could be wrong there. Yeah, I didn't really consider the king x for him, but I guess king queen and king jack are pretty reasonable hands for him to play that way. Well, let's see. I mean, let's um, let's not speculate. Let's suppose that you have Ace 10 suited, and your opponent has, let's assume he doesn't do this with 10, so he's only doing it with pairs that you're flipping with. He's not doing it with ace king. I'll even throw in one more dominated ace for you. Let's say that his range looks like that. How are you doing? Yeah, so even there, even even with the king jack thrown in, you're only at about 52%, which ordinarily I would make that call, but because we are on the final table bubble, I think you might want to be a little more risk averse than that. Um, and for you know, for calling 20 big blinds, even out of your big blind, I mean, you probably only need something like 47 or 48% equity to, to break even in terms of chip EV, but I think you want a bigger edge than that to call off 60,000 chips. So that, that might actually be a fold. 
And of course, it only gets worse if he does have Ace-King in his shoving range, or if we take Ace-5 out of his shoving range. Like, I doubt his shoving range is much wider than what I just gave him. Um, yeah, probably good, final table bubble-wise, just any two cards. Uh, I think you can do it again. You know, if anything, Penny actually has to fold even more than these two players do. So I think this is another spot you can probably open any two. And Jack Six Offsuit is actually very slightly better than any two. Uh, this one I might fold though, because your position is getting worse and worse, and the player in the big blind is very short stack, so he's going to have some incentive to just go with the hand. Uh, Penny really should not be folding very much there though. Penny should probably be jamming on him pretty wide. And you're not going to be able to call that. Okay, we are at the final table. I'll be back in a moment. And I guess it looks like we actually maybe had two eliminations on the bubble to have only eight people now at the final table. Uh, very nice to be coming in as the chip lead. And you should be thinking in terms of putting pressure on the players with medium stacks, like these three players here in particular, which unfortunately you don't have great position on them. I would say that probably your strategy coming in should be to back off a little bit. I mean, when you're in late position, you can try to steal, like if it folds all the way around to you, I think as you can raise pretty aggressively when Voida or, or Bondarovsky or, or Penny is in the big blind, but from early position, I think you should back off a good deal and, and sort of wait for other people to bust out and you can do a little bit of laddering and then see what the situation looks like after that. Okay, we've got nine players now. I guess they were just slow to fill that seat. Like he, he was going to be dealt out the first hand, I guess, because of his position relative to the blinds. So this is definitely one that I would up on the button, given the chance. Um, you can definitely do some light three betting in this spot, but I wouldn't do it with queen 10 offsuit. If you had an ace in your hand, you could think about it a little bit more. I like the way Bondarowski played that a lot. I think I don't really like Black's flop bet that much. Although if there were three hearts on the flop, it's a little bit better. I think there were actually. So yeah, I, I, I think they both played that fine. Um, he's jamming 40k over and under the gun limp. I like calling with ace-queen suit. I think that's perfect. I, th I would not raise, you know, I think you wanna give yourself room to fold if one of these three players shoves. Um, so I, I think calling is perfect. Very nice. Nicely played, nicely run. Um, you might, yeah, I would open this. I just think right now you should be putting a lot of pressure on these. There's so much pressure on these three players not to bust right now, and you're in a position to bust all three of them. Even Dadishka actually has a bit of pressure not to bust because these are the two shortest stacks. So this is a, an opportunity where you should really be leaning on these players. And I think opening, like, I don't know if I would open Jack-5 all suit, but I think Jack-5 suited is, a, is enough of a hand to... Um, to be putting pressure on those players with the raise. And you can see, look, I mean, Voita folded to a min-raise in position, getting, you know, four to one. So even Bondarovsky is is making use of that. Just, just you know, based on, on that play and, and the ace-nine offsuit, he strikes me as a kind of talented player. So this is actually the, I mean, I, I think raising with king-nine offsuit is fine, but this in general is not the player you want to be pressuring. This player, his stack is forcing him to make moves. You want to be pressuring these people who have no incentive to make moves, like these, these three players there. Uh, and actually, it looks like Bondarovsky once again, uh, flipping it around and putting some pressure on you. I mean, maybe he just had a hand there, but... I've seen him play a couple of hands in in what seem to be pretty good ways. So, oh, and actually, let's go back and look at that because he ends up showing down eight five suited, and I'm curious what was the context for that. Uh, so that would be this hand. Um, yep. So there he is putting in the light three bet with eight five suited. Ends up getting cold called by Voita. Uh, I think at this point Bondarovsky can bet. I guess he's just really suspicious, but I wouldn't bet the river. Wow, that's a really bad call call by Voita. But yeah, so I mean, we can see Bondarovsky really is trying to put pressure on people. And I think he got a bit lucky there to see those chips go from a very uh, seemingly strong player to um, a seemingly weak player. I like the pull with Jack-5 offsuit. <coughs> Yeah, 
Vanda is not slowing down. And like the kind of stuff that he's doing is the stuff you should be doing. Um, you, were, I mean, you're the one with the most chips. You should be in a better position to pressure people than he is. Uh, I would call that. I think he can be shoving quite wide there as the shortest stack with you know it open folds to him, which folds him with seven big blinds in late position. I think I, I think this is a pretty clear call based on offset. But I mean, I think he can have any ace and you know a number of other worse hands. Uh, Banda, where are you with three bet when we need it? Uh, I think I think you can bet here. Um, I know we've talked earlier in the video about not wanting to turn Ace King into a bluff, and it's um, I mean it, it definitely is what you're doing here by betting. But I think there's enough room for you to put pressure on pocket pairs below a jack that uh, like you, again like you should be all about pressure right now, especially with these two players. So I, I think betting would be good. Um, I mean I like that you're not folding, but. Yeah, I just I think if, if you're gonna put 12k in the pot, I'd rather do it by betting than by checking in this situation. Um, now you should make a small bet of your own on the river. Uh, good, I think that's very nice sizing, and that's gross when he raises, but I think it's a pretty easy fold, really. Good. Yeah, I like I like the way you played the river there, and it's a, that's a, those are tricky river spots, so I don't want to I don't want to um, belittle that or or not make it seem like a big deal those those are good spots to get right but i think you might actually be better off just betting the flop there i hope the check wasn't based on something as simple as a rule about not bluffing into two people because i think that was a pretty good spot <clears throat> uh yeah that's good Pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't think there's any reason for you to three bet rather than call. Um, it's not like anyone's going to be priced in for calling twenty eight thousand if you just cold call. And you really should be encouraging people. Like you would like somebody to try to make a move on you with ace queen or something, and you'd like to be able to have a range here that's going to call and, and fold to a shove as well. So I, I think there's, I mean, it's not going to make a big difference, but I don't see any reason to make it 70K here instead of just calling. I hope that's not something you were too upset about because you've had, uh, certainly had your share of luck in this tournament, not just in terms of like suck outs or winning flips or anything, but I think with some of those bluffs working, you know, there's, there's an element of luck involved there as well. Um... I guess there's a lot of ace king in this check back range. Yeah, I, I suppose checking there is fine. Um, yeah, probably not gonna make much of a difference whether you whether you check or bet. <clears throat> I do like that you didn't just automatically bet top pair. I don't think it would have been a bad spot to bet top pair, but I, I don't think it was a bad check either. And, all right, finding, finally putting some pressure on Banda. I think that's good. Um, the one thing to keep in mind though, he is raising, there's a little bit of pressure on Penny because AL is still in there with a shorter stack. Yeah, I think that's a good spot. I wouldn't do it with just anything, but I think a suited ace is, is good enough to come after Banda. Um, nasty flop though, really good flop for his calling range. And it's actually a decent flop for your range, it's just a bad flop for your hand. So I think you should just check and give up. Um, again, some, some luck there involved in actually having that bluff work. <clears throat> Perfectly played with the deuces, just kind of unfortunate that Bond is good enough to put you into that spot. Nice hand. Wow, Banda is not giving up easy. Okay, so let's think what we want to do here. The best case scenario would be if we could just bet flop, shove, turn, but I think we're a little too deep for that. Even betting like 40K on the flop is still going to leave 
110 to 150. Yeah, it's a bit much. Um, so I guess then you're going to have to break it into three bets, and that's going to mean betting more like a third of the pot on the flop, like 25 to 30K. Um, that seems too big. I, it's hard for me to imagine you doing this as a bluff. I don't think I would suggest you doing this with like Ace King. Uh, and he's willing to call you anyway. Now I would check. And I, that might not be obvious. So let's see. Great. Okay. So I, I won't go into a lot of uh, detail there, but I think it's really good that you checked. And now I would shove the river. I think that, yeah. So checking again here, I think, is a pretty big mistake. Um, and I don't. Again, like, I don't know if this is associated with you like being afraid that he hit the flush. Like The reason I'm checking the turn is in order to induce bluffs or him to like bet for protection with a worse pocket pair. It's not because I'm worried about him having a flush. I mean, if he has a flush, you're going to lose your stack. I think he can have hands as strong as like queens or jacks here. Um, he, but even like tens or nines, he might be tempted to call a river shove with. Uh, I think... I think I mean, I know it's a final table, and he's in the second place stack, and it's going to be kind of hard for him to shove or for him to fold, but uh, for him to call. But at the same time, um, I just think he's going to have a pocket parallel. I mean, you have to bet something here. You cannot expect him that he's going to bet for you. I just don't see that happening very much. Um, and again, if you're beat, like you're going to lose a big pot. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess shoving would have been a disaster in you know against that exact hand. I just don't think you're going to be beat very often here. I think he's going to have a lot of pocket pairs in his range, and you should be thinking in terms of getting value from those. Um, so you know, again, like checking and calling did not save you a bet here against a better hand, as opposed to you just betting forty five thousand yourself. Um, and what did happen is that a lot of times he's going to have a hand like tens where he's happy to take a free showdown, but would have called 45,000 and you're going to have uh, cost yourself something. So, I mean, shoving may not be the best play because of his you know, risk aversion at the final table, but I think that you you need to be betting something there on, on the river. I think checking and calling, very similar to that first hand that we discussed, I think that checking and calling is a pretty significant mistake. Maybe not so much in terms of expected value, but in terms of like how you're thinking about the spot and, and the hand. <clears throat> um, this is okay if he's folding too much, but it's not the greatest hand to do that with in a vacuum. <clears throat> Good sizing on that. Um, I think I would go ahead and bet the flop. I mean, if he doesn't, like, I think he could have some dominated aces, and if he doesn't, he's not really going to improve anything. I think your hand is strong enough to get all in with. Um, and, I mean, the main thing is just that you're not setting that much of a trap because if he doesn't already have a hand that can pay you off, there's really no way for him to improve his hand to the point where he's going to pay you off on the next street. A king is actually one of the best possible cards for you, and even that is not, I mean, even if he turned a king, like, how big of a pot is he going to play? If you had a worse kicker, I'd be more in favor of checking the flop, but I think ace-queen is strong enough to, to just come right out betting for value. <clears throat> um, again, like this is a kind of thin call anyway, and especially when you are second in chips at the final table. Um, you really should not be getting yourself into marginal spots against the chip leader. So you know, th this is not a normal tournament spot where I wouldn't, you know, I still might fold this, but I wouldn't consider this too bad of a call in a typical tournament spot. But with this exact you know, final table dynamic, I don't think anything good is going to happen as a result of calling there. You're just going to end up, even when you make a pair of set, like if this flop had been king, queen, seven, like you're still not getting to showdown. And even though you will have the best hand plenty, there's nothing you can do to, to realize that equity, which is why it's not really a hand that you want to call with. I do like that open, um, and unfortunately, you were just getting owned left and right by Vonda. <clears throat> um. Yeah, okay, so he's he's raising a third of his stack. I wouldn't shove with a seven. Interesting. That 
that seemed like a little much on Vonda's part that, that King forced it in hand. Not not as bad. I mean, I'm, I'm laughing. I actually don't think it was atrocious, but I think it was a little much. Um, yeah, he's not going to let you get away with anything there with King three offsuit. I think if anything, he's like playing back too much. So I wouldn't try to open my button. Good. I would be folding that to his raise. Good. This though, um, let's see. Yeah, I well. It's a little much to risk given Fonda waking up. I don't know. I think you might want to run this one through um, ICM Miser. I'm not real confident about what the right play is here. I can actually see, I can see shoving, I can see folding, I can see making a small three bet, planning to call against black, but fold to Fonda. That might actually be the best play. I think w without running it through ICM Miser, my guess is that just making it like 30,000 here is, is the best play. <clears throat> And, and then calling it off against black. Uh, I would shove this. Mm. The thing, I see, I think that you're looking at calling as a, a less risky thing to do, and I think it's actually more risky. Like, Bond is probably opening any two cards here from what we've seen of him, um, which means that when you shove, you're going to win uh, a big pot. You're going to win 24,000 chips with no showdown a huge amount of the time. And that really reduces your risk a lot. Versus when you call, you're going to have a very hard time winning pots after the flop. Like, I mean, rarely are you going to flop this well. Most of the time you're going to miss a flop even harder than this, and Bond is just going to take the pot. So you're really, you're actually setting yourself up to lose very frequently by, by calling. You should uh, definitely just be check shoving there, yeah. I mean, so that worked out pretty nicely for you, but I think you're better off just shoving pre-flop. <clears throat> And even though it involves putting all your chips in the pot, I think it's actually a much less risky thing to do than, than calling. D doing a lot of, of calling, you're just going to end up bleeding your chips away. Um, I wouldn't even hate a shove here just because Bonda seems to be opening way too much, but uh, this is a more reasonable call. Against uh, someone who's not Bonda, I, I would definitely just call with it. Um, this is not the time to check raise. You're going to be in terrible shape against this calling range. Um, good. good. That is a nasty turn card. However, I think that, well, so now it comes down to how much do we think Bond is playing well versus how much is he just over aggressive. Um, I think you should probably be planning on calling again. Uh, I don't think you actually have a lot of ASX in your range. I think you're probably jamming most of your ASX pre-flop. Um, and I think that you can be peeling the flop with some hands that are going to be folding now to this turn bet. I don't know that Bonda would actually bet here if he had an ace. I kind of suspect that he wouldn't. So I think that his value range is like trips him better. And I think he's bluffing, just from what we've seen of him, he seems like he's going to be bluffing way too much. I think that you should probably be calling that. Uh, it is, it's, it's a kind of gross spot, but... Um, I think I would just close my eyes. And, or, I, actually, I think I would call the turn and fold the river is what I would do. <clears throat> I, just, I, don't, I really don't see him betting an ace there. I, I think you are pretty close to the top of your range. Um, this, probably a shove. Although he is opening 3x. Yeah, I can see folding that. I guess that's okay with the queen 10. Mm. I do think Bond is jamming pretty wide. He might even be jamming any two, but even then, you're not that far ahead of any two. Yeah, so you've got like 57% against any two, and you only need 45%. Um, let's see how you're doing against, let's slice off the very worst hand. So let's just say he's jamming 80%. He's not shoving these particularly bad hands. Yeah, you're still at 55. Okay, I'm in favor of calling. You are the shorter of the two stacks as well. 
certainly in favor of spiking traps. <clears throat> um, I, I do really hate folding when I'm getting big odds like this. But 8-4 offsuit is really, really bad. I might actually consider a 3-bet fold. Just make it like 34,000 and fold to a shove. Um, that might be one way of handling this. Uh, I definitely bet the flop. I don't think you should bet very big though. I bet like 10K. Yeah, that's way too big. Um, you're just, you know, if, if you think about what's the purpose of this bet, it's mostly just to make him fold over cards. Um, you're not going to be ahead of his calling range, and you don't really want to get check shoved on even, so I would just bet 10k. Like, that's so you have to be worried about this now. Now you really have to just shut down, and I would fold to that, actually. Like, what are you beating here? What's he check calling with that, and then, like, betting the river? King nine, apparently. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I mean, he spazzed pretty hard there for that to, to work out in your favor. Um, unless you had some reason to think that was going to happen, this seems to me like you just got pretty lucky that he did something really dumb. Um, I would not advocate betting the flop. Bonda just doesn't fold very much, and um, unfortunately that's a pretty nasty turn card for you. Nonetheless, I'm tempted to call once. I just don't think Bond is doing a whole lot of value betting here. Um, I think he can have a tremendous... Like, I just... Um, you know, think about how good of a hand he needs to value. Like, can he do this with a jack of hearts? Probably not. Queen of hearts, even? I don't know. Like, I think a lot of those hands he's going to check once and then try to value bet the river. So, and I think he's just going to be bluffing here really, really, really often. So I think you should call one and then fold the river. Um... I, th I think you're making it too easy for him to take small pots away from you after the flop. Like you're just you're never calling him with a bluff catcher, even though he's doing a lot of bluffing. You're just sort of like, well, you know, it's a scary card, so I'm going to fold. And I think that's it may even work against weaker opponents, but I think Bond is too good for something like that to pan out. I like the way you played that King Ten. Pretty big beat for you that he got there. Um, I think you just have to stop doing this, like raising these hands that are going to be folding to three bets from Bond and that don't have it. Like if you have an ace in your hand, it's a different story, but I don't think a king is a significant enough blocker for you to um, to go doing that. Like I think you have to realize at this point that Bond is just going to be three betting you really aggressively when you're when you're raising there, and, and uh, you're not going to be able to get away with doing it with with the wrong range of hands. Um, I like that. I think this is the sort of thing we haven't seen enough from you um, of just just you know not letting <laughs> not letting Bonda kind of run you over. And I think this is a reasonable check raising hand actually because a lot of the better a lot of the hands that are, you know, are coordinated in a bigger way with this, I would have either shoved pre flop or I would be calling or you know I would re raise pre flop or I would be calling the flop with. So yeah, I think this is like a, the backdoor gut shot is actually a pretty good check raising candidate. So cheers to you for that one. Good that you didn't try to raise that. Um, yeah, I think just calling there is good. Uh, definitely a check call on the flop. Now, see, this is um, this is another example of you turning, like, taking too strong of a hand and turning it into a bluff. Like, like Ace Five is in pretty good shape against Bond's range, and more importantly, he's not folding hands that are better than Ace Five. So I think you need to get more comfortable playing hands like this as bluff catchers, rather than feeling like just because you don't have a pair means that you know you you have to either bluff or fold. Um, so quite lucky there. Um, yeah, I guess I would just keep betting. You're not blocking any part of his, um, and any of your value targets, which is really nice. I would keep it on the small side because we've only got a PSR of like 1.5. So I think you can probably bet as little as like, so if you bet 40K here, and then, yeah, maybe like, I wouldn't bet more than half the pot here, that's for sure. Maybe just like 50K. Yeah, nice. And then, yeah. 
I like the size. The, the sizing on the turn is, is real good, but I, I really want to emphasize how much of a mistake it is to check raise the flop, and it, especially because it's something that's come up more than once. Um, I don't like that open, even though it, you've, you did finally get one through. I, I still just think it seems like he's going to three-bet you way too much to do that without any blocker or anything. Um, again, too good of a hand to turn into a bluff, just to check it behind. Let him do the bluffing on future streets and you're a good bluff catcher. Um, yeah, one more time. I think this is a call rather than a raise. Uh, that doesn't mean you'll never bluff with King-10, but um, I think I would I would start by calling, and there are some boards where I would just check it down. But I think you know you're you're just going to be check raising at way too high of a frequency if you're if you're check raising this hand plus all the better check raising candidates. Because now, like, I mean, I guess I guess now I would want to bet something like seventy seventy five thousand. That's way 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 too small. You know, you're just not putting any pressure on him. I mean, he's why would he fold anything? Getting getting like. Four to one. I mean, I think all you're getting them off of here is like floats. I think other than that, uh, and, and you really should be trying to put pressure on stronger hands than that. I think you you really need to bet bigger if you're going to be trying to pressure him. But I mean, mostly you shouldn't have. I think you shouldn't have check raised that hand on the flop. But I mean, if you are going to bluff with it, you've got to got to put some teeth into it. Um, I don't like raising him with jack seven off suit. I think that's too weak of a hand, and he doesn't seem like he's ever going to fold his big blind, and it's. Not really a great hand to see bet on this flop either. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're just giving away a lot of chips here. Good that you didn't try to raise that one. Pretty nice flop. Um, I, yeah, I don't think you should raise here. I don't think he has a lot of dominated aces in his range. Um, I mean, maybe you're thinking he has a he's got flush draws, but you have like a, you have a really significant flush draw blocker. And even if he does have a flush draw and the flush gets there on the turn, you're still going to be drawing live. Like this is this is I think too strong of a hand to raise. Um, I think you should be you should be slow playing this. This is like a perfect slow playing hand. And uh, you're, you're really doing him a big favor by raising on the flop and just letting him off the hook with his bluffs instead of uh, giving him rope to keep firing at you. Uh, I'm more okay with that open than the jack four offsuit one, but I, and I guess now that you have bond out chipped, actually, I like it. I, I wasn't really paying attention to the chip dynamic, which is a big mistake at the final table, but I like that um, for that reason. I like to fold with the dis four. I don't, yeah, I mean, you're not going to get away with raising any two cards against Bonda, even though you have a chip advantage. Like, he's he's just not going to let you get away with that. I like that you're giving up. Um, I, I I don't think you can bet the turn. Yeah, it just seems like you're, you're bluffing here without much of a plan. Just, yeah. Uh, the, the, I mean, this is a good example of why you don't want to open this pre-flop and why you can't just, you know, randomly bluff with, without regard to your cards. Sorry if that sounds kind of harsh, but um, that's, that's the reality of the situation. Uh, interesting. I don't know if that's the best hand to do that with, but I think it's interesting that you did it. I like that you're that you're getting experimental with him. Yeah, that's definitely one to to four back call against Banda. I might have just done the shoving myself. Actually, I don't think you're ever gonna fold to a shove after you make it one sixteen, but it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> Nice. That's pretty good for you. I mean, that, that's really good for you, actually, for, for Black to win that instead of Banda. Um, 
Yeah, I like the Judas Calling there. That's good. And I would fold. Perfect. I like that you didn't that you didn't feel compelled to check raise the flop. That's another spot. I mean, even though it's just queen high, it actually has some showdown value there. Um, whoa. Yeah, you can't fold king six suited on your button. That's a that's a very good hand. I'm hoping that was a, a misclick or something. Um, no, you should bet the turn. You have the best hand very, very often here. Yeah, you're just you're playing that too passively and letting him own you like that. That that should be a value bet on the like I would even value bet a lot of rivers. Like I would I'm not that river, but if the river is a blank, I think you can even value bet that hand twice on on the turn end river. My my guess is you don't have a lot of experience playing heads up, which is you know typical of a lot of tournament players. But it's an important thing to practice because it um, it will make you a better poker player generally. But obviously, when you get to the end of a tournament. Um, it's important to be able to play heads up well because the prize difference between first and second is significant. Um, if you were deeper, I think this is a good hand to three bet, but what's gonna happen here a lot is either you're gonna see the flop with a low SPR, which doesn't really favor a suited connector, or he's gonna shove on you pre-flop, and both of those things are pretty bad. I would rather three bet a more polarized range um, here, you know, either hands that are gonna play pretty badly post-flop that have a blocker, like a king eight offsuit or something, king, king four offsuit would be even better, or, uh, or very strong hands that are happy to get four bet on, and I would not three bet a hand like seven eight suited with these stacks. <clears throat> um, this is not a terrible hand for shoving, but it's a pretty good hand for calling too, so I like that. Um, that's good. So now we wanna find a way to put 263,000 into the pot. And I would probably start by betting like 80, and that'll put 360 and leave 280 in your stack. Yeah, I think betting 80,000 would be perfect. That's a little too small. You're not going to be able to get stacks in on the river, I think. So you end up on the on the on the turn, you're betting 25% of the pot, and now on the river, you're going to need to bet 67%, and that's not great for you. I mean, obviously this river is is not one that you can value bet, but in general, like you're you'd rather be betting a more similar fraction of the pot on both streets. So lucky and then unlucky there. <clears throat> That's a good shove. Open limping wouldn't be a disaster there. I think with, with you know 20-ish big blind stacks, I think having an open, open limping range is pretty reasonable. I like the call with king five offsuit. A small three that would be defensible as well. Very happy that you called the flop there. I think I haven't seen enough of this, you know, calling with with weak unpaired or you know with with kind of marginal unpaired showdown value kind of hands. But um, especially given the size of his uh, of his bet, I think that was good. Folding the ten three offsuit is fine. That's good. You could you could bet here. Checking is is okay too, but uh, dunking wouldn't be the end of the world. Yep. Interesting to note that he just potted it there. I mean, that that's a potentially very useful sizing tail to keep in mind. Good. Um, that's interesting. I think you should probably call once, but I don't think it's the end of the world if you chose to just fold. Awesome. Nice end. Yeah, this is a better three betting candidate than the uh, the eight seven suited from before. Uh, I might size a little bit bigger on the flop. I mean, if you had aces, is this really what you would bet here? I think I feel like you'd bet more like sixty or seventy thousand. Um, and this is the other thing. Now you end up in this awkward spot where you can't really shove the turn. I think if you would bet more like seventy thousand on the flop, then you can just shove the turn, and I think that's the way to go because that's an awkward spot for you if he now shoves put you in a pretty gross spot. Much better if when you're when you're semi-bluffing with the draw, you really want to be the one making the last bet rather than giving your opponent room to make that last bet. Uh, so don't turn this into a bluff now. Don't yeah, like this is just not he's not gonna call with worse. He's not gonna fold better really. Like this is a good enough hand to just check call. That's like the, the theme of this video is your 
you're turning the wrong sorts of hands into bluffs. Just because you don't have a pair doesn't mean that you have to bluff. Um, yeah, that's fine. Checking is actually not a not too much of a problem there either, but I don't want to make too much of a stink over that. Um, I guess that's okay because he hasn't been doing much four betting. This is a hand where I really don't want to get four bet because his four betting range is going to include hands like ace queen and pocket nines that you have real good equity against. So this is almost too good of a hand to four bet fold, but because he hasn't been doing a whole lot of four betting, I think it's all right. Um, I I really would not. See about the flop, I don't think. You just have no coordination with the board whatsoever. Um, is this really how you would play an ace? I'm suspicious. He can have ace X in his range. Uh, and that, now this, again, it just feels like you're trying to bluff your way out. Like it, I, I mean, I'm sure you have some regrets related to this hand already, so I don't want to like harp on you too much, but I, I really hope that if, if this tournament didn't, that this video will hammer home to you the importance of getting sharper on your bluffing and the reasons for bluffing, because it feels very kind of arbitrary to me right now, like that you're just kind of betting and situated, like you're just kind of betting anytime you hope your opponent folds, rather than really kind of understanding the, the math behind bluffing and like what exactly, like thinking in terms of a specific target, a hand that you're trying to scare him off of or, or get him off of and why you're bluffing with this particular hand and not some other hand. You know, just, just like value betting, like there are hands that are good for value betting and there are hands that aren't. And that's true for, for bluffing as well. It's not entirely about the situation or what you think your opponent has, although you should be thinking about those things, but it is about your, your hand as well. And I, so I would really encourage you um, to watch my bluffing series on Tournament Poker Edge and I'll send you a few other um, resources related to bluffing. But I mean, overall, I, there were a lot of things you did well in this tournament. I hope I highlighted those. And by far, the, the, the number one thing to work on is, is um, mostly, it's, I mean, this is not, th this last hand is not so much an example of this, but it's just not, not turning overly good hands into bluffs. Like don't, you don't want to bluff when you have a lot of showdown value, but you also don't want to just kind of arbitrarily bluff. I, like you've got to be careful about not bluffing too much. And I think a few of these spots we've seen, um, you just it would you would have been better off giving up with with a big part of your range. And it seemed like instead you were going to be bluffing a big part of your range. But hope you enjoyed this. Thank you one more time for the donation, and uh, thanks everyone for watching.